Um, this is really wonderful to be able to hear and uh, just spend a whole weekend with you uh, on the topic of mission. I personally, uh, mission gets me excited and I hope uh, over this, this weekend we'll be sharing, we'll be considering this topic and hopefully uh, uh, that will excite you as well. Uh, God's work all over the world. Uh, and, but where our focus is local missions. So we're gonna talk more about what's going on in the United States and what's going on in our hearts that God has been uh, putting this beautiful country uh, to all of us. Uh, let me just start with the, the PowerPoint. It, is it okay? Oh, okay. Okay, here we go, yeah. Okay. We're going to focus in Acts 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 6 to, to 8. But um, before that, uh, uh, just now, our pastor has shared about something, a little bit about me. Uh, yes, I was indeed, I was born in Taiwan. Um, when I was 13 years old, our family moved from Taiwan to South America. Uh, first of all, I was, uh, first I was in, um, we, we, we lived in, in Paraguay for several months. And later, uh, we moved to uh, Argentina. So I grew up in Buenos Aires. I went to high school in Buenos Aires and then uh, in college uh, in Buenos Aires. Um, I always consider in Asia, when uh, living in Taiwan, uh, a lot of effort, a lot of uh, uh, the atmos uh, um, atmosphere in, in, in Asia is uh, study, 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 right? You have to study education. is probably the primary uh, focus of, for all children living in that continent. Um, a lot of focus in education, studying. Went to Argentina, uh, the focus is a little bit different because a lot of sports uh, play, people play. They, people play uh, soccer um, and rugby and, and things like that. And then also in, in arts, uh, Ar Argentina is famous for its music, tango, uh, which is original of the country. Uh, it's a mixture of the African music plus the, uh, the Indian, uh, the local indigenous music and plus some of the Southern, uh, Southern European uh, uh, music. It's a mixture of all together and then it's a blending, everything that come out with its own original, as a original music in Argentina. And so I was in the land of education in Asia, then a land of uh, sports and, uh, and, and arts and music. And then came to the United States. I came after college, I came for grad school, and then later uh, God gave me the opportunity to stay here continue to work, just like what uh, Pastor has just mentioned. Um, so um, this is really a land of hard working. <laughs> we work very hard in this land. And really, uh, this is also a land of opportunities. I think uh, we do have a lot of opportunities that God has given us as a, as a as country. It's a very rich, uh, very rich in resources, and we have a lot of opportunity to develop our talents in this, uh, in this society. But I found out in every country, in every country, God took root in their in their societies. In every country has its own indigenous churches. Every country has its own way of worship, worship styles, and um, seeing Christian wit witnesses in all different fashions. We all become disciples of Christ, but different flavors. Some, we're American disciples of Christ. There's Argentinian, South American disciples of Christ. We also have Asian disciples of Christ. And when I, when I consider, um, Does he move? Or I have to turn on. Oh, here you go. Did I turn it off? It doesn't reach that far, I think. Does it work now? Oh, yeah, here we go. Right, okay. Okay, yeah, uh, so maybe we should, we should start focusing on, on the passage first because this is a, a passage about the, about the Great Commission. Usually you remember Matthew's, Matthew 28 um, is the passage of the Great Commission. But actually, Acts 20, uh, chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, also has a, has a big uh, portion about um, what God, wanted, God, wanted, God intended for us to, for his Great Commission. Uh, let me just read it to you. Then they gathered around him and asked him, 
Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set uh, by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the, of the earth. So here we have actually a progression of, uh, of, of, of places. You may be able to help, help me. Um, yeah, here we go. Thank you. Okay. Um, a progression of Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of, of, uh, of the world. I just want to, uh, uh, this evening, I want to share with three, three to see this progression of, of locations, of places, through three angles, through three different angles. Can you press for the next one? Yeah, okay. The first one is, we're going to see it as the disciples of Jesus' time. When Jesus uh, gave this mandate to his disciples, say, you know, go to the world, uh, from the Jerusalem all the way to the ends of the world. What, what did the disciples at that moment, how did they understand? How did they understand what Jesus was referring to? So this is, first of all, we want to see it through the angles, through the perspective of the disciples of that time. And second, we want to see it through the, the angles of the missiologists, the strategies for mission. All, the, all over the years in, 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 in the church history, church leaders or, or the mission strategists, when they talk about, when they think about mission, when they saw these verses, what have they, what have they seen about how mission, how the mission of God should progress from one place all the way until the ends of the world? What does that mean for, for, for missionaries? But the third one is more theologian. The theologians, when they see this passage, they, they would see from a, a, the angle of the people, people of God. The people of God, well, who are they? Maybe from Jerusalem all the way to the ends of the world. How do they see, how do they, un, uh, do they understand this passage? In other way, we can understand this first from a geographic perspective to understand these, this progression of locations. From, for the missiologist, we see it from a cultural perspective, the cultural distance. And then for people of God, we see it through a theological angle. Can you, we can go to the next? Yeah. So let's start with the very first one. What did the disciples actually see this passage when, they, when Jesus was telling them from Jerusalem all the way to the ends of the world? Um, the, the task itself is to bear witness in order to, uh, to bear witness about what Jesus has done, what Jesus, who Jesus was, and, uh, yeah. and, and this is black. Okay, all right. So we're going to focus on that. Uh, can you go to the next one? Okay. If you were a disciple at Jesus' time, when Jesus said, you know, go from Jerusalem all Judea, Samaria, all the way to the ends of the world. How did you understand? Well, Ju Jerusalem is that black circle that I, that I put over there. And then Samaria is probably that, that uh, uh, circle with the, with the brown, um, uh, brown boundary. And then all the way to the ends of the, of the world. For the disciples, uh, they thought about, well, Jerusalem, if Jerusalem was the center of, the, of their world at that time, what is the center of your world? I, I, I live in New York, right? So in New York, when we talk about center, the, the, the point of reference, when we talk about distance from New York, we talk about from Central Park in New York. So from San Jose, I'm not sure where you, what's your, what's your reference point in, in, in San Jose or in this Bay Area. Is that? Fremont? Okay. <laughs> probably, probably. But any, any place, any place if, we, if we consider things geographically, we always have a reference point. In New York, it's Central Park. In, um, in, in here, probably, uh, maybe, I'm not sure, Vermont, uh, 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 Fremont or uh, uh, for, for other places. But whatever, there is a center for the, for the disciples in Jesus' time. When they heard this, Jerusalem seems like is the center for them, is the, is the reference, point of reference. This is where they are. But then... Where is, where is Judea? Well, Judea is the 
the larger circle of, of, of Jerusalem. And then where is Samaria? Samaria is maybe toward the north, toward the, the outskirts of Judea. So it more or less is still in the area of, the, of, of today's Palestine. But then comes the idea of the ends of the world. The ends of the world. Where is the ends of the world in Jesus' time for his disciples? Well, Paul, for Paul, he has mentioned about he wanted to go to Spain, right? In the Bible, he mentioned about he wanted to go to Spain. For him, probably Spain is the, is the, 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 the ends of the world. And then Spain, um, uh, in this case, is the, the other ends of the, of the Mediterranean Sea. So he wanted to go to Spain, and then he asked the, the church in Rome to support him. Eventually, he didn't go there. He didn't get that far. But for him, maybe the ends of the world, the ends of the world is Spain. Can you, can, uh, let, me, let me try this one now. Okay, okay, here we go. But later, or, or you may know that the, the Spain, uh, I mean, Spain actually is not the end of the world, right? Spain is not the end of the world. Actually, actually, if you continue to travel from the Mediterranean Sea, you get to Spain, and then further west, you can continue go, continue going, continue going all the way. There's more ocean, there's the Atlantic Ocean. And then what did you get? In, 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 the, in the 15th century, the explorers, they, were, uh, they continued to sail west. They started from Spain, from Seville, and then continued to sail west. They, they went across Atlantic Ocean, and then they found America. They found America. They found America, they found, they found America. They, then there's a whole, whole century or two centuries of exploration trying to understand this new, vast piece of land, North America, Central America, and South America. And then continue to sail west. You see, what you get? You get Pacific Ocean, right? So you start with Mediterranean Sea. You go to west. You get to Spain, which was the extreme, the ends of the world for Paul's time. But then it continues to sail. As human knowledge continues to develop, to add more knowledge about geography. So we learned that there's, there's more ocean. There's the Atlantic Ocean. And then there's more, more land, dry land. There's a continent, America, North America, Central America, South America. And then there's the Pacific Ocean. And then finally, you continue to sail west. Where'd you get? You get to Asia, right? You get to a whole piece of land. You go to all these, these islands in the Pacific. And then you go to Southeast Asia. You can get to China. You can go to India, which is, uh, you know, and the, 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 you know, you, you know what, what all, all, all is about. So eventually... Eventually, you can go get back to Jerusalem, which means that what is the end? What is the, the, the ends of the world? They realize that we as human beings, we realize that the world is round. So where is the end of the world? If you read this passage as a disciple, you ask the same question: Where is the ends of the world? Where is? Where is the end of the world? According to Paul, his knowledge of the world, the ends, is in Spain, which is the farthest place from his point of reference, right? So what would be the farthest place from your place, from, from, from Fremont? What is, the, the, what is the, this, this area, this world, this, this world in the, in the other ends of the, of the earth that is the farthest from Fremont? Where is it? Right. Yeah. Okay. 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 Where is it? Just, just, just a guess. Shanghai. <laughs> where, where could it be? <laughs> it's very far away. Yeah. I thought in my home, I was, I was trying to figure out all these things. I thought, could it be South Africa? Eh? The ocean. Well, if, it, if there's any dry land, I thought it was maybe South Africa. Maybe what, from, from your place, when you fly, the forest place, where could you be? From New York, I know, to Singapore. 
Singapore, the flight is 18 hours nonstop, this, which is the farthest that I, understand, that I know. Uh, but uh, from your place, maybe go to South Africa, right? all the way. So this is a very far place. So what's the ends of the world? Well, the disciples back then, probably it's the farthest place from where they are. And Jesus was saying that, be my witness, bear witness, not only here, but also there, even to the farthest place from where you are. I was preaching in, uh, when, I, when, I was, when I was young, when I was in Argentina, I remember our small, our, our, our small Chinese church, they, you know, all the, all the uh, people used, used to say that we live in the ends of the world because Tierra Fuego, which is the southern tip of Argentina, actually the city, the city called Ushuaia, is the, as, as, as people, ha have, people have claimed, this is the, the, the southernmost city in the world, is closest to the South Pole, Ushuaia. So they claim that we actually live in the, in the ends of the world. But then in May this year, I was preaching in, uh, uh, in, in Stockholm, uh, uh, Sweden. They were claiming that they are actually living in the ends of the world because they are closer to the North Pole. So whether you're close to the South Pole, to the North Pole, you think you're the farthest place. But actually here, if, you, if, if we go back to the first century, we think, about, we think about what would the disciples understand when Jesus was saying that you should be my witnesses from Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and then to the end of the world. What did he mean? Or what, how could they understand how could they understand what, what it means by ends of the world, the farthest place where they are? And so people make that question all the time over the history of Christian church. People ask the question, well, if we, don't, we can't finish work in Jerusalem, how could we start ministry in Judea, in Samaria, or even ends of the world? If we cannot even finish our work locally, how can we do it globally? The idea is that when Jesus said all these things, he was saying that you'd have to do it simultaneously. So there, is, there could be a massive amount of people from the church working locally because most people don't travel that much. But there will be selective people who God has called and so for them to go further, to go the, to the, all the way to the ends of the world in order to, reach, uh, to, to bear witness for Christ. We should be doing all this work simultaneously. A church, we should do it simultaneously. Maybe locally, we should mobilize our congregation to do it all together because that's where we have concentration of our members. But there are also selective people, a group of people who received a special call from God to go to the ends of the world, to the farthest place in order to share the gospel, to give witness uh, uh, for Christ over there. And that should happen in all churches locally and globally. But they are, there's another, another consideration for this idea, is that how did the missiologists, the, the mission strategists, they talk about this whole idea of mission uh, from Jerusalem all the way to the extremes of to the ends of the world. I mentioned uh, these three people, um, Cameron Thompson, Donald McGovern, and Ralph Winter. Um, Cameron Thompson, he was, uh, a, he was working for Bible, Bible Society, actually. When he was young, he was selling Bible in, uh, um, if I remember correctly, it was in Guatemala. He was selling Bible there. When he was selling Bible, um, so he was selling Spanish Bible to all the people over there. But then one day, he was selling the Bible to the indigenous people in Guatemala. And, they, and they, they, for them, you know, this is a, a language that for them is a, is a Second language, Spanish is a second language. Actually, they have their own dialects as their own uh, indigenous group. So they told him, he, they said, uh, um, if your God is so smart, why can't he speak our language? Why do I have to read Spanish as, as his word? Why can't I read his word in my own language? If your God is strong, if your God is, is smart. Can God speak the language of, that you use? Think about it. When you pray to God, when you pray to Jesus, how did he answer you? How did he answer you? Did he answer you in English? Or he answered you with other language? In Greek? In Hebrew? How did Jesus answer you when you talk, 
when you talk to him, when you pray to Jesus, certainly you pray, you pray to Jesus in English. You know, but in what language did he, did he speak to you? Did he answer you? Or use sign language? How did he do it? How did, how, how did Jesus answer you? Well, definitely, Jesus uses a, a language that you understand. And usually, I would say, he would answer you in, in English, if English is your mother tongue. God uses his mother tongue to talk to you. And so here you have this, this, this person from the indigenous tribe. He was telling uh, Cameron Thompson, he said, you know, if your God is so smart, why can't he speak our language? So he developed this understanding that, you know, there's a group of people in different places. They are always a group of people that they, they would prefer to use their own mother tongue to, in order to understand the word of God, in order to understand this. And so, so he said, one time he said, the greatest missionary is the Bible in the mother tongue. It never needs a furlough and is never considered foreigner. That's, that's, that's a Bible in mother tongue. So you read Bible in English because English is your mother tongue. So he developed this understanding and eventually he, 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 he pursued a career. He developed this whole ministry of Bible translation translating Bible into the heart language of different tribes, different people. And so he is the founder of the Wycliffe Bible Translator, a mission agency. And then you have this man, Donald McGovern. Well, he, he, his major contribution for mission is that he talks about people's, people group as a conversion unit. He said, since the human, fa- human family, except in the individualistic West, is largely made up of such caste, um, clans, and peoples. Uh, so the Christian uh, 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 of, of, of each nation, uh, when we do the Christianization of each nation, it should involve the prior Christianization of his various people as people. He's, he's talking about reaching out people as a group, not as an individual, because we... If we, want to, if we want people to become Christian, well, in the West, we talk about individuals, individuals becoming, becoming Christian. But he thinks that maybe we should think on people group instead of individuals. When we think about mission, we should put our focus on people group in, it, in their conversion instead of individuals' conversion. But then you also have this man, um, this man, uh, Ralph Winter, He's he putting the idea of mission of, of people group into another level. In, 1970, in 1974, in the Lausanne uh, Congress for, evangelize, for World Evangelization, he proposed the idea of the so-called um, uh, hidden people group. Hidden people group. He thinks that, well, there, there's, a, there's a, a group of people who they have, uh, they know uh, that, that when we do statistics of mission, uh, of, of missionary work. We say, well, say, for example, the, the whole city of Fremont, well, there are, uh, maybe there are 50% uh, population who are Christians. So this is a pretty good number. So we're doing fine. Our uh, mission, it seems like we have reached to a lot of people in this country. But the idea of that is that maybe there's a pocket, there's a people group, where without outside force to help them, there would, there would be no wit- Christian witness among them because there's no Christian witness in their own heart language. And therefore, this is a group of people who is hidden from the statistics. They call them hidden people. Eventually, later, people think about hidden people. The idea of being hidden is kind of like, it doesn't sound very, very nice, almost like invisible people. So later, the idea was changed, and the name was changed to become the so-called unreached people group. People that this, he's talking about a, a certain group of people, that this group, that people have no, they will, there will be no Christian witness, there will be no Christian movement, unless there's an outside force coming in in order to do evangelistic work. The whole idea of group, whole idea of, of considering people as a group is very important. A lot of times we consider, in, when we talk about mission, we talk about people, individual, but then, uh, then actually the whole idea of, of, of as a group, in a group movement is important. Um, 
I came to the United States in 1987. In 1987, uh, actually in 1986, McDonald uh, was introduced to Argentina. Before that, um, Argentina had no, no McDonald. And this is a country that we eat a lot of beef. So we usually, you know, for a, for a lunch or for, uh, for some other, other meals, you will have a piece of steak. That's, that's how you eat. So I never had McDonald's. I never had hamburger, uh, uh, McDonald's hamburgers uh, before coming to the United States. I, I came one year later uh, uh, after the uh, McDonald's was introduced. When I came to the United States, I was eating these hamburgers, um, and I thought, you know, if we can, if I, if I live in a place where we eat the, uh, the beef as, a, as an entire, as a, as a, as a, as a piece, it's a, it's a steak. But coming to the United States, it's the richest country in the world, and yet we're eating all this ground beef instead of uh, uh, the, the, the actual uh, a steak. So I was, I was actually puzzled when I came to this country. I thought, how would people would do that if, you know, this, how, would, 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 uh, how would McDonald's would have business in Argentina if people are used to have steak instead of ground beef? And yet, 20 years later, I had a chance to return to Argentina to visit. And I found out people still line up to go to McDonald's and get their own, ground, uh, own, own, own hamburger instead of having, having their, their steak. Why? Because I think this is a power of a people group. When there's, there's a power, it's a group of people, they, they, all, they, they all claim to each other. They, this is a peer pressure, right? They all claim to each other, this is nice, this is delicious, this is good. Then start slowly, start get, getting to the, this change of taste. People start eating um, um, uh, hamburger and think that is a delicious food. I think uh, the power of group and the power of group conversion could be important. And then here, this is the idea of these three people. They say, you know, when we think about mission, we just think about people group. But when we think about people group, first of all, there's the issue of language. Language should be their heart language. Second, the conversion, we should be considered as a group instead of individual. And the third one, Ralph Winter was saying, the idea of enriched people group or the so-called hidden people group. These are the priorities because there's no Christian movement among them, unless there's an outside missionary work introduced or intervened among themselves. So from there, from the idea of these three people, when they, all these missiologists, when they propose these ideas, they come to the idea of the so-called um, cultural distance. Instead of a regular geographic distance that we are talking about from Jerusalem, all Judea, uh, Samaria, all the way to the ends of the world, they talk about cultural distance. And so they said, there's a scale. You can have E0, E1, E2, E3. We talk about the, the cultural distance between the evangelist, the person who, evangelized, uh, who, who evangelizes, and the potential converts. This cultural distance, there could be a very far or very, very, very short, very, uh, very short distance. The E0 is the people who uh, have been coming to church. There is no cultural gap between this person because he's not converted, but he comes to church all the time because his mom asked him to come. So he comes every Sunday. He knows what we're doing in our, in our worship. He knows what's the next, uh, what's, what's, what, what is considered offering, how we should be singing, how we, we, that we should be standing up for, 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 for singing, and all these type of things. So one day if he converts or somebody wants to share the gospel, he would have no problem to understand because he knows the culture. He, culturally, he's very close with, with all of us. But then there's somebody who is in the same cultural background as us, but they're outside of the church. This is considered as E1. We're the same culture, but not knowing Christ. So the cultural distance is still very small, but there's a little bit of church culture that he's not understanding. And then you have e, e, E2, E2 will be a, a different culture, and yet E3 will be a very, very different culture. Many years ago, when I was uh, uh, at First Baptist Church of Flushing, when I was serving there, I was serving in this, in this, in this uh, Spanish congregation as, a, as their pastor. And one day, somebody showed up. Somebody showed up and, and uh, attending our church for several times. Then we, we noticed that she has been coming. And, um, and one day, so I, I talked to her. I said, uh, where are you from? 
because she has a she has a Spanish that is a little bit different in in her accent. So I said, "Where are you from?" She said, "Actually, Pastor, I'm African. I'm from Mozambique." You're from Mozambique and coming to a, a Spanish-speaking church? He said, she said, yes, because in Mozambique, we speak Portuguese. So Portuguese is very close to, to Spanish, pretty much like Cantonese with Mandarin. So uh, it's very close. So I can understand what you're talking about, although I'm from Africa. You guys are from Latin America. So this is the so-called E2. People have different culture, but they're close by because they can understand each other with their language, Portuguese versus Spanish, and also um, she, but she's from Africa, uh, and the rest of the congregation, they're from Latin America. So there are different type of distance, but when we talk about cultural distance, there are the E0, no difference, no distance, uh, very close. And then you also have the so-called E2, E3, which has quite a bit of cultural distance among different people. If you see this world map, you're going to see that all these dark red color, it's more like uh, this is a dark red color. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, that, that represents countries where Christianity is the number one religion. It is the religion that professed by most people in that country. Christianity, I mean global Christianity. That includes uh, evangelicals, Protestant, uh, uh, Catholic, and even Orthodox. So these are the countries that has the, that our Christianity is mostly professed by uh, by its its population, and then you also have this uh, this little block in the middle where you have other religions. These are the primary religion of these countries in North Africa, in Middle East, and Central Asia. These that is that's Islam. Islam is the major religion for these region, people of these region, and then you have also. You have the dark, um, that probably is, is a dark green. That is India. So Hindu is the primary religion of India. And then you have this brown, brownish color that is mainly Buddhism. Buddhism is the primary religion for Mongolia and for Southeast Asia. You also have this, this yellow, which is unaffiliated in, in terms of atheist. That it would be a primary um, uh, way of thinking among the people in China. So these are the places, these are the places where, where the primary religion is not the so-called global Christianity. Global Christianity represents in the rest, in North America, Central America, and South America. And then you have South Sahara, um, Africa, you have um, uh, Australia, and the majority of Europe, and, the, um, and Russia. But that's not all the story, because uh, you can see that when, when, when Ralph Winter talks about the hidden people or the so-called unreached people group, here we are, these are all the red dots. They're mainly represented in all these red dots area. So if you see that red dots area, it's more or less the same place where that, that, that uh, previous block is, um, places where the primary religion is other than Christianity. That's why people call that as a 1040 window, latitude 10 to latitude 40 from Atlantic to Pacific. This is a place where you have a concentration of people who don't know Christ, who don't know Christian faith, and yet they're either followers of other religion or they're unreached because these are the so-called unreached people group or the hidden people. But that's not the whole story because in the past 45 years until now, probably uh, 50 years, it's a big change on, on, on Christian populations in different uh, continents as well. This is a chart, this is a uh, map where you can see that um, the, all the yellowish, uh, all the uh, orange color that represents actual reduction of Christian population in these places. All the blue ones that represents the increase of Christian populations in the past 50 years. So you can see that we in North America, how are we doing? We're not doing well. We're actually decreasing quite a bit. Uh, Canada, United States, Europe, uh, Western Europe, and Australia. These are places where actually we suffered a great reduction of Christian populations in the past 50 years as compared to other places. If I, if I, let me do this, it is a little more, more, more specific. That 
in the changes over the years, if you do some calculations, if you divide the world into Europe, North America, and Asia, Africa, and Latin America all combined together, you can see that back in 1900, the majority of Christians in the world, they lived in Europe. A total of 68% of the world Christian population that lived in Europe. A 14% living in North America. And then a, another, you, you help me, what's the number? 13 or 18%, they, they live in a combined Asia, Africa, and Latin America. That number continued to change. So in 1970, 70 years later in Europe, well, now represents only 40% of the world Christian population, from 68% to 40%. And then year 2000, it re continued to reduce to 28%. And today, mid-2023, actually it represents 22% of world population, or world Christian population, they live in Europe, down from 68%. In the, in the turn of, uh, of, of 20th century, all the way uh, to 22%. Continue on, 2025 will be 21%, and the projection is that 2050 will continue to reduce all the way to 15%. That's in Europe. North, North America, we're not doing that well either, because although we maintain from 14% to 70%, 13%, but then mid-2023, now we reduce to 10%, and then and then continue on, and 2050, we will go on all the way to 8%. We continue to decrease as well. The story, the different story is that, however, in Asia, in Africa, and Latin America, they continue to grow from 18% all the way until today's 68%. Uh, 68 and then in 2020, uh, 2050, we will have about 77% of the world Christian population living in these three continents. So what does that mean? Talking, thinking about only Christian, only evangelicals, the, the, the projection is the same. Okay, so in, in 1950, more or less 1950 is the turning point. In the past, in the past, Christians in Europe continued to grow all the way until 1950, then start to decline. For North America, similar story, although our, our rate of decline is not as fast. But then also in 1950, these three continents, Asia, Latin America, and, um, and, and Africa, the Christian population continued to grow and exponentially growing. The red, red line represents Africa. It's growing very fast. The yellow line represents Asia. And then, and then that, that, um, that, uh, that, that bluish, light blue line represents um, uh, Latin America. They continue to grow uh, starting from 1950, around that time. Now, there's another story, because so we, now we can remember, now North America, Europe, uh, all its Christian population continue to decrease. But then Africa, Asia, and Latin America continue to grow. And yet, there's an issue of migration. These three continents, they continue to move people to the other continents where Christians are, uh, Christian population is in decrease. So from Latin America, Africa, and Asia, they continue to move from these places to North America, to Europe, and to Oceania, to, uh, to Australia. So where are we now in the United States? In 2020, year 2020, we have a, a percentage of Christians, uh, all these, these blue, blue color, Blue color represents the, uh, uh, the, the so-called the, the, white, uh, the white church. That includes uh, evangelical, that includes uh, the, the main line, that in includes the, uh, the Catholic altogether. And then all the, all the, all the green, green color, that represents the, the African-American church, the Hispanic churches, other Christian church represented in, the, in, this in this country. But then all this brown color, this brown color uh, is a continually, continuously growing seg segment of our society. That represents our Jewish community, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, and other religious group in this country. This is a group that, that has no knowledge of Christ because they profess to other religion. And then you also have this purple color. 
This purple color, this, uh, this 23%, this is a, a, a segment where you have a large percentage of population. They are not affiliated with any institutionalized religion. They claim to be spiritual, but they're not related to any, any uh, uh, institutionalized religion. The so-called nuns they have nothing to do with any religion or, or, or any formal religion. That comes to another result of statistic. Um, these are the people of a mission organization called Global Gates. They, they are, um, it's an agency that started uh, in 2013, and they, uh, they, they work among the, the minority groups in this country where they, um, uh, they did some research and they, the statistic, and they said, well, the most enriched people group in North America, where are they? Who are they? The, the way to classify a so-called enriched people group is that among them, among these people groups, there's a less than 2% of people who are Christians, who are evangelical Christians. And then, and then they consider, they found out that um, uh, uh, in order to be considered a group, they have to be represented at least with a population of 5,000 people. If you have fewer than 5,000, they're, they're, they're uh, statistically very, very neg negligible. So they have to be more than 5,000. And then they have to be, uh, in, in these groups, you have, you have, if you have less than 2% of evangelicals or non-evangelicals, they found out about 50% of all these groups, they live in three cities, in Toronto, in New York, and also in Los Angeles. These three cities. The rest are living in other cities in the United States. And then among them, 40 of them, 40 these groups, 40 groups, um, they, they are, they're actually, um, there's, there, there's no church. And um, among them, it says 20 of them, there are no known Christians. There's no Christian at all among them. These are the so-called the enriched people group living in the United States. In total, in total, there are about 274 groups in this country. So thinking about enriched people group, they're not far away from in other continents. They're in the United States because there are immigrants coming from these countries and they live among us. And they mainly they represent these coming from, they're, they're coming from these five religions. They're Jewish people. They're a Sikh religion, follower of, of Sikh, uh, Sikhism. Uh, they're Muslims. They're Hindus. And they're, they're Buddhist. They're Buddhist. Among them, among them, uh, the majority of them, uh, they are Muslims, 41% of this population group, and then 31% they're Hindu. These are the largest group. You guys here probably see quite a few. Uh, you, should, you should be able to see a lot. Uh, they're living among you guys. They are living, they are your neighbor, they're your coworker, and they may be your, your, your schoolmates as well. So these are the main primary people who are the so-called the enriched people group locally. And your church, we as Christians, we can do something with this. The idea of these people, the so-called UPG, enriched people group in North America, we have, we just said, we have 274 groups in the United States. They are enriched because their original country are unreached. They, most of them, they come from the so-called 1040 window that I have just mentioned previously. So there's a, there's a certain level of correspondence between these two. There's a so-called the transnational ties between those two. So if you reach out to these people in the in United States, there may be some connection that they will, have, they will be able to do it with their own home country, which in a lot of countries, you have no access as a missionary. So this is the opportunity that God has given to us that we should be able to take advantage of it. Significantly, New York, Toronto, um, Detroit, Los Angeles, and Montreal, these are the major five cities where you have a concentration of all these people. But San Francisco and Bay Area is not, is not uh, 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 out of picture either. You, your area, you have a very large percentage of these of the people represented by the four, five religions that I, just, that I have just mentioned. You can see that this world 
has changed. The idea of Christian mission also has changed. We live in different world now these days because the world has come to us. In the past, we think about the, the ends of the world is the farthest place from us, we thought. And then people told us, well, but there's a distance. We can also, instead of considering geographic, geographic distance, we can also consider cultural distance. If that were the case, then people with very different cultures, they are the, the ends of a world. The issue is that today, these people, they have moved in our midst. They have come to our country. They, they, they have become part of our population. They have become a sector which is so isolated without a Christian witness from outside, they cannot, they cannot come to Christ. And so we have daily contact with them today because they're our neighbors, they're our co-workers, and they're also our, our classmates. So we are the one, not the missionaries, not the professional career missionary having contact with them. We as members of the church, we have the first contact with, the, with all these people. So God has given us the opportunity to interact with them. What will we do? Let me talk about this a little bit. Do you recognize some of these people? Somebody not had, right? Okay. Well, who is the one on the right hand side? Messi, right? Messi. He's the soccer player, current soccer player, playing in the United States as well. And so he's, he's, he led Argentina to win the World Cup in 2022. Who is the one in the middle? Anybody of my age probably remember? Maradona. That's right. Maradona is the, the one in the middle. So he led, he led Argentina to win the World Cup in 1986. So who is the guy on the left? Who is the guy on the left? It's probably hard, and, uh, except Monica. I'm not sure if Monica is going to figure out. <laughs> His name is Mario Kempes. Mario Kempes, he is the, uh, he's the, 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 the soccer striker that led Argentina to win the first World Cup in 1978. So all these three, they are the, the stars for Argentina's uh, national teams. But there's a difference. Okay, so you can see from their uniform, there's a big difference. Mario Kempes, he's, he was wearing long sleeves shirts, right? And the, the other two, they were short sleeves, right? Because Mario Kempes, in his time, the World Cup was celebrated in Argentina back in, the, in June of, 19, uh, of, of 1978. So in June, in Argentina was winter. It's very cold. So he has long sleeve. But then the other two, they were, they were having World Cup in, during summertime. So they were all with short sleeve. But what about their shorts? Is there any difference between these, these three people, among these three people? The shorts. That, that was my focus. Messi has longer shorts, right? Pretty long, actually, all, all, right, all the way to the knee, right? But then the other two, they have very short short, right? Well, I belong to the generation of the short shorts. In my time, if you do sports, your short has to be short, really short. But over the years, the culture has changed. The world has changed. I have a son, when he was young, he was, in, he was insisting to wear a shorts that all the way go to somewhere, you know, below his knee, right? And I was angry. As a father, I was angry. I said, what's this? This is not shorts. This is long pants now, right? You want to wear shorts? You wear shorts. Yeah. So I had a lot of fight against, you know, with, with my son when he was young. That was because I didn't recognize the time I was, I was living. The time has changed. The world has changed. The culture has changed. So a longer short is the norm for today. And I had to adjust my own views of aesthetics, my own views of what is nice, what is, prop, what is proper for, for wearing uh, 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 to, a, to a sport. The same thing happened about mission. Today, when we talk about missionary work, it's not only done by missionaries. 
In the old time, missionary work is done by missionaries because you have to go to another country where pe people have no access of the gospel. So missionary individuals, they have to go that far in order to share the gospel. But today, we live in a different world where people, actually people have no knowledge of Christ. They come to our midst and we, our interaction with them, our sharing of the gospel with them, uh, I keep moving, oh, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Our sharing of the gospel with them yeah, is not done by professional missionaries in this country because we are the one, as a member of the church, as a member of the church, as Christian, individual Christian, we are the one who have first or closest access to these people, to the ends of the world, culturally ends, at the, 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 the cultural distance. To the ends of the world, we are the one actually having the, the access. We are the one having the first contact with them. They are your neighbors, again, they are your, your classmates, and they are also your co-workers. So we bear the responsibility of missionary work, not only the missionaries. We live in a different world. I ask God to lead us in the future as a congregation, as individuals, that we acknowledge our responsibility and this great privilege that God has given to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you. From this Jerusalem story, we realize that the distance could be geographic, could be cultural. But, and yet, Lord, we pray that today we are coming to you as people that you have put us in the front line, because it, that's we who are having this access of interaction, of daily interaction even, with our coworkers, with our uh, neighbors, and also with our uh, classmates who have no knowledge of Christ. They come from many parts of the world, and yet they come to this, this land. If we as a Christians, we pray, Lord, that you use us to become the agent of the gospel, so we share the gospel so they can understand. They can understand and learn about Christ through our interactions. I pray that you will help us to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.